Good morning. Thank you, everybody. I'll be taller than I am. Um, our opening this morning comes from Romans. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. And I thought this is Romans 12, but I thought that describes this planet. So uh, when I found it, I thought, hmm, we've got to use that. Let's pray. God of love, for love's sake and your glory, help us to see, hear, and love others in practical ways before we selfishly consider ourselves. Any member news that we need to be aware of? That, maybe that's good news. Um, this is our last Sunday in the garden room for a while. Next Sunday, we move to Redhead Hall. It will be June, and in June and July, Sandy will be with us. So even though we are moving, and won't be just ourselves, it could be good with them. And please, don't forget about the collection plates. Again, this is our last Sunday before whatever we put in goes to the young men's Bible class. Any other announcements? Okay. Mother and the First Presbyterian Church, who has enriched us with their gifts and their talents, are Tom and Kate Gillespie. Kate was the daughter in law of our much loved son, Isabel Gillespie, and she's also a retired PCUSA minister. It's an honor for us to have her today because she is very busy. Kate, all yours. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, is this your normal format for someone to stand up here and talk? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. If you want to do anything differently, I'm open to that. Okay. Because sometimes the rooms get all situated from the previous class or the future class and not the one that you're in. I got that. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Kate uh, Huddleston Gillespie. I'm an ordained Presbyterian minister, retired, and now a board-certified clinical chaplain. And I work at Cone Health at uh, Cone, Moses Cone Hospital and Western Long Hospital. And I uh, have a 20-year history of a palliative care chaplain. So I work with people who are quite ill, uh, all ages, and who have had trauma and end of life, approaching end of life. And that's been an honor and a blessing because I uh, didn't plan it, but God planned it for me to do that. And when I was in parish ministry, I enjoyed so much the moment of being with people, doing pastoral counseling, and in the most crisis moments of their lives. And God kept talking to me, talking to me. I did what you should do, and I kind of wrestled with doing my own thing. And finally, I said yes to God for a second or third or fourth time. You know, how you, God calls you in all our own ways. And um, I finally said yes, and now I get to do that. And I met my husband, Tom Gillespie, who's the middle son of Isabel and Don. He, our, uh, Donald Jr., uh, Carter, and Tom. And um, Carter is a Presbyterian minister as well. And my daughter-in-law is a Presbyterian minister. So we've got even the family, <laughs> right? And when I met Tom, I was asked to be a um, a guest speaker at a church in Danville, Virginia, and my good friend was getting installed as a minister there, and she invited me to come speak at her installation. And Tom was the coordinator of the event. <laughs> Funny, and I had been single for seventeen years, and my um, Tom had been widowed for two years. And we were not looking to meet and not looking to meet anybody. <laughs> and God had other plans. So God put us together and it's been a wonderful thing. He worked for 30 years as a hospital administrator and I worked for 20 years in the hospital. So we have that shared and church shared. So now we moved to Greensboro and we're having a wonderful time learning North Carolina. It's new for me. I know some of us have not originally from here. We've all moved here later on in our years. So I, if you have any pointers or hints of where the good shopping is, where the good lunches are, or the best dry cleaning, I'm open to hearing the conversation. 
Alan, I need to know. That's right. I'm so glad to be here, and I love being part of um, this church. It's wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I don't know what I can do about it other than standing like this. Yeah. Or holding the microphone like this. Yeah. Um, but if you need to hear better, raise your hand, and I will increase my volume. Okay? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. You can take it off. Oh, I can take it off. All right. Oh, that's better. Is that better? Ah, aha. Uh -huh. Now I'm a Hollywood performer with a microphone. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, we all know what today is. So some of us have uh, red on, right? Some of us have got a little red scarf or a red purse or red shoes or a red dress, or we have red in our hearts uh, for the Holy Spirit. It's Pentecost Sunday. So we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate. What are we celebrating on this Sunday? We're celebrating the arrival of the Holy Spirit coming on down. That's right. Descending like a dove. How often has that peace of God descended upon holy people? Right from the beginning with Moses. Starting with Moses. And all the way to Jesus and then to us. So that's what we're going to celebrate today. I'd like to open up with a very powerful poem that's very old, the first century, written by a Benedictine monk in Germany. His name was Robanus Maros. And he wrote, he lived in 776 and died in 856. He was a very, very long time ago. But the poem is beautiful. It's a prayer. And I'd like for you to um, listen to it. Come, Holy Spirit, creator blessed, and in our souls take up thy rest. Come with grace and heavenly aid to fill the heart which thou hast made. O comforter, to thee we cry, O heavenly gift of God most high, a fount of life, a fire of love, a sweet anointing from above. Thou in thy sevenfold gifts are known, thou finger of God's hand we own. Thou promise of the Father thou, who dost the tongue of power in view. Kindle our sense from above, and make our hearts overflow with love. With patience firm and virtue high, the weakness of our flesh supply. Far from us that drive the foe we dread, and grant us peace instead. So shall we not in thee for God to turn from the path of life aside. <clears throat> oh, may thy grace on us bestow the Father and the Son to know, and thee through endless time confess of both the eternal spirit blessed. Now to do Father and Son who rose from death be glory given with thou, O holy comforter, and forth by all earth and heaven. What kind of experience? What was what was the monk's name? The monk's name was a German monk, Benedictine monk, Rabanus Maros, M A R U R U S Maros, Rabanus Maros, German Benedict monk. Probably wrote that in a Benedictine abbey in the first century. And it's still beautiful today, is it not? All language, but beauty is the same. Okay. So the, today we're talking about something that happened a long time ago that was powerful and it formed the church. It made the church, what happened after the Holy Spirit came? What happened to the church? Exponential growth. 3,000 members. Can you imagine this church this size growing boom like that? By the end of the day, 3,000 members had grown in that church gathering, the first gathering. The word synagogue means a group to gather, and our churches are modeled after that. Synagogue means gathering of a large gathering. So this is the beginning of our first large gathering. Okay. So tell me what you think how the Holy Spirit invaded the church and asked. What do you know about it? What do you guess about it? 
What do you suppose about it? I don't know if this is proper in this class to ask questions, but I'm going to ask questions. Oh, yeah, I guess the first. The power of literary work yeah. empowering people and changing lives. Empowering people and, cha and changing lives. Yeah. Yes, yes. What else do we know about what the Holy Spirit way invaded the church? I think it was powerful. I think it was mind blowing to the people there. We'll read the scriptures and talk about that, what that means and how it happened. Have you ever had an experience in a public event or even your private home and you just can't believe it? Right? Remember, you, you say, this can't be true. This can not have happened. How could that be? Was it a miracle? When your child comes to you and says something that you've been praying for for years, and they tell you, Mom, I believe in God, or I changed my life around, or I'm marrying that girl, or I'm not marrying that girl. <laughs> we don't have to this for you, for them, and you say, Wow, what an imbued Holy Spirit moment. God was present. That's powerful. Very powerful. Now, in Acts 2, after Jesus ascended, he went up to heaven, all his fathers were gathered for a feast, the feast of the Pentecost. Originally, it was called the Feast of the Harvest. And we named it the Heart of the Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, we remember after Jesus was crucified and died and rose again and, and came back to life and appeared 10, 12 times, people were blown away and surprised by his appearance, right? In the upper room, on the beach, uh, on the road to Emmaus. Wow, they're surprised that God shows up. And didn't Jesus himself predict that? Where did he predict it? Who did he tell when he was coming back and going to show up? He just told his disciples. He said, I'm going to show up and I'm going to, and then when he finally decided to leave, not decide, when God decided for him to be ascended, he said, my Holy Spirit's going to be with you. And here it is. We get to see it play out right again. Jesus and God's promises were always true, always correct, right on time. We just weren't paying attention. And then we get a surprise. How did that happen? So as we talk today, let's think about Ways in which we've been surprised by God. And think of the moments in our individual lives when God has just shown up. And I describe it as I describe this as God just taking his hand and going along my face, my cheek. This is just for you. No one else knows that this is a God moment. No one else knows that some miracle has happened. But God is just saying, This is just for you, Katie. I'm here for you. And I believe this is a long series of moments. Acts 2 is a culmination of many, many miracles, many, many moments of God lighting on to people. And then we all come together. And we are here, and our church exists because of this moment in history. This moment of Acts 2 is very powerful, just as if it was as powerful as Jesus being born and God becoming mankind in the form of a baby, and then Jesus dying on the cross and resurrecting again. It, the church in the Acts is much more important. So when that Holy Ghost came, it was like a baptism. It was an anointing. It was a total baptism. When I go see patients in the hospital and they are ill and they're sick and they're, they're fearful or they're confused or worried, I ask if I can anoint them with oil, and a change happens when I anoint them with oil. I put the sign of the cross on their forehead and on their wrist, and they know that God has been present for them, that I was a vessel to help them understand that they have their own moment of baptism, whether a believer in the church or not, whether they attend church their whole life, they get that moment of baptism of the Holy Spirit comes to them. And the apostles saw this in action, in Acts 2. And we benefit from 
this moment in time. So let's take a moment. I'm going to read Acts 2, but I'm also going to start with an Old Testament reading, Numbers 11, very old reading of the old scriptures about Moses, what Moses went through when he was leaving, oops, when he was leaving the people out of Israel. Remember that? And when the people were in the desert in Israel, what were they doing? Were they happy and go lucky and pleasant? No, they were what? Complaining, they were moaning, they were groaning, they were saying, We want the old food, we want those cucumbers back home, we want the big veg fresh vegetables. They didn't want the monitor from heaven. They complained and complained and complained. So, Numbers 11, verses 24 says, So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them, and they were the among those who were registered but they had not gone out of the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the name of the camp. They are here, prophesying. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant to Moses, one of the chosen men of the 70, said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Does all that the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them? And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. What do you think about that? What do you think happened there? Moses was the leader, and Moses was under a lot of pressure, remember? Moses had needed people to help him. He couldn't do the heavy load. Even holding up the Ten Commandments was a big job. Didn't his brothers come alongside and help prop his arms up? It was that hard a burden, not only to uh, display the Ten Commandments, but to teach the Ten Commandments to the people gathered in the desert at that time. So the Lord saw this and helped Moses, took the Holy Spirit that was in Moses, the leader, and lifted the burden and helped help give power to other people, other leaders. And it was a great um, emancipation for Moses. It gave him a break. It gave him a burden that was lifted. And yet it spread because the Holy Spirit and God saw him. So I'll go on to Acts 2. When the, pardon? The question? When the day of Pentecost had come and they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven, they're keeping around the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and its tongue rested upon them, each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And now they were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each and one had heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked one another, Are not all these who are speaking, aren't they Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Hegra. Pamphila, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Thracians and Arabs, in their own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, oh, 
But Peter, standing in the eleven, with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Peter said, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these people are not drunk, as you propose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, if that was true, what was spoken to the prophet, how do you reconcile this? So the prophet Joel, Joel said, In the last days it will be. God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon the flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. What do you think they were feeling when they saw all this happen? What would you think? You know, fear? Fear? What if a, a crowd appeared on Elm Street and started talking in all different languages? They probably do right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we should pay attention, maybe. <laughs> yes. I read somewhere that actually it was only two languages. Oh. And you know, a lot of people speak two languages. Correct. So today we have people who speak two languages, and maybe we ought to pay attention and hear what they say. That's right. But in this scripture, it talks about the people from all over the world, all over the area, uh, from out from Jerusalem, out all the way as far as Rome, all the way as far as Asia, minor, pretty big. Territory. And didn't Jesus tell us that we were to go and you know, spread the gospel across the world? Right? So I think this is the, the blast off, the opening day, the kickoff of that. <laughs> right? Go, go now and speak the local language wherever you are. When I was called to be a minister, I had learned to speak the language of small rural church town that had chicken farms and turkey farms around them. The air smelled terrible. The people were lovely, but the air was terrible. They had prison in the town as well. A lot of prisons, actually. A state prison area. And on my front porch of the little church manse, I had a porch swing. And I'd sit in this little house, porch swing, on a summer night. And it was dark out. The sun would set. And over in the corner, there was this huge light in the sky. I'm like, I can't miss that light. That is so bizarre. And I asked someone in town, what was that light at the night time? They said, oh, that's where all the prisons are. They had five prisons, and they had five locations, and there was a light lit up so high, like it made, they never went to sleep, and you never saw the night sky because the light was everywhere on them. Um, and that was a tough town to prophesizing. That was a tough time in town to uh, preach in. And the congregation that I served in that little town uh, had prison guards and people who worked in the state prisons. And uh, on Sunday after Sunday after worship, I'm going to put the mic down. This is how they greeted me at coffee hour. Hi. <laughs> they were like these big broken hands who didn't talk much and they were prison guards. And I sang, I chose a hymn song about set the captives free. And a man came up to me after church and said, don't ever sing that song again. Because <laughs> we don't let captives go free. And I don't know which again. And that was terrifying to me. I had to learn to speak their language. They were terrified of the people who were the us down, the prisoners and the guards. But the prisoners were administered to through the chaplains and the ministers in the community, but the prison guards were kind of ignored. And so when you ask them, how was your day, Joe? How was your week at work? Did they shake their head? You don't want to know. They're not telling you where our week is at. And I had to learn to speak their language and search my heart to preach to them to give to them. So all of us have to learn to listen to the language that others are speaking because they might be speaking something very foreign that we don't know, whether it's a foreign language or a foreign message that I don't understand. 
Look at the good work that the church does here in Greensboro. All the hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people that we serve and help make sure you speak a different language than all of them. Do they not? And what empowers this church to help them? What empowers you all to go out and serve on the Thursday, Tuesday, and Thursday night dinners, on the meals, meals, on the food bank? What's what empowers you? The Holy Spirit. You're doing it. You're living out Acts 2 right here when you do that. You all are prophesying in your own right through the actions of your hands, through the work of your body, through the mind, the heart, the soul, the spirit, all of you have a role. Look at the ministry that Nancy does. We walk past that every day when we come into the church. Look at all the ministries that all of us have done over the years in this church and other churches all across the world. God has empowered us to do that. I think that's just fantastic. And I think that Israel was trying to work this out, figure this out. And what would it be like for us to continue to be more prophet like? Not that we have to do it, but recognize what you are doing as a prophet. You are prophesying. I'd like for us to go around the room and just say one word or one word to describe the kind of God's work, Holy and Spirit infused work that you do, whether to the church or an organization or your family. Betty, could you start? What do you do? I write sympathy notes to members of the congregation. Write sympathy notes to people in the congregation. And that's the ministry. That's the Holy Spirit. Nancy, what do you do? Well, my, my job is to be a librarian, but I, I know so many people in various situations, and I uh, hope I always be in touch. Yeah, I love that. Very good at that. Vicki? I would say fellowship, especially for people who don't meet each other on a regular basis. So, you know, if you have them on a bus, then take them so they are in the office. And you're missing them. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They're helping you know. Yeah. We call it the travel ministry. I mean, I'm still <laughs> yeah. having a break. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's good. That's a good ministry. What ministry do you do? Just be graceful. Just be grateful. Just be grateful. That's it. Okay. That's wonderful. And passing out the word like that, what you did today. Dolly, what do you do as a prophesizer in your worship? You're sitting table. Yes, you do a beautiful job of that. Whatever goes to a luncheon, you are there and you're touched and everywhere. That's right. What do you do? I try to be a good listener to someone without giving any advice. Well, being a good listener without giving advice is really wonderful. Sometimes you just need someone to listen to. Them. Not tell you what to do or how to do it. And how to say that was for doing that with you. And you learn that firsthand. Awesome. What about you? What do you do? I try to bring food every week to the um, family. Mm -hmm. Food drives. Yeah. I need to do that. Oh, yeah. And you know that food will go where you're at and you're the first thing that goes. Awesome. What do you do? I put people in housing. New put people in new housing. Construction. Construction. I have yeah. to do the actual closing and I do, you know, all the personal contacts as well. And you help them see the hand of God in their lives by doing that. It's a happy job. That's very good. What do you do, Dan? I inherited manic depression. And um, I like to think that I can be stable through these wonderful drugs that my doctor has given me yes. and maybe you know just be a good Christian. Absolutely. And to be alive and be there for your family and to feel the power of God helping you. That is beautiful because it's a daily thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's a daily thing. It's like the hour. 
What do you do at the moment? And what do you do? It is not a Presbyterian home, but it is uh, the there's a whole lot of things. They want the Presbyterian stuff. And I'm stable and happy and healthy. <laughs> yeah, with that I feel better. Yeah, <laughs> but, I know. I know. A lot of them are. And you can come on Friday. Well, I'm glad you keep your peaceful. I think your peaceful comes from peaceful. So your ministry of peaceful, so your ministry of peaceful, I'm giving one half of it. Okay, Charlotte, what about you? What do you do here? Well, I live just like in town. It's funny to say this. And it's just being together with other people and listening to them. Oh. Help them in any way we can. That's what makes me like that. Quiet. Give it to me. Period. Yes, that's all. <laughs> all of it. All of it. You're just like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you you are present in this stage of life. You're present and show the love of God right where you are. Yeah, we see that. We see that. Just that and and everywhere that you live, the community that you live. Was that you think that's a good question? Sure. The question is, is how are you your own prophet in your life? How do you show the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Uh, I pray a lot, and I do believe I have the Holy Spirit. And I have a particular place I go to pray every morning mm -hmm. and at night. And I just try to do my prayers, reach out, and ask for blessings mm -hmm. for blessings for me and my family. Mm -hmm. And I try to do things that I feel people need. I take food and and call them and ask if I can do anything. Mm -hmm. I have friends from high low places, mm -hmm. all different colors, and and we keep in touch. Mm -hmm. And I feel very blessed. Yes, I mean, and she has a sense of humor. Yes, thank you, God. Thank you, God. It's always helpful. Oh, I'm <laughs> Have your own Facebook page and, and be yourself. Yeah, you know, and I think that's what God took me and asked you to be ourselves. He had gone from Rome, or I'm from Jerusalem, or I'm from Asia, or I'm from Greensboro, or I came from Cleveland, Ohio. I have to be myself. I take a green girl and say, what is this? <laughs> um, I'm ready to speak a lot of language and help the people inside me. And uh, that's what all of you are doing. So thank you. That's just so much. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Um, in the Bible that you read Acts 2, when the things happen, so the speaking of different tongues, and some of the people in the synagogue thought that they were drunk. And when you went to minister, when you were ministering, and using the word that could liberate, and somebody comes to you because of his work, you feel that that should not be you. How do we handle that in our society today? And still love people and still let the message not be diluted. That's a very excellent question. How do we still do the work of God and not let it be diluted? Uh, and still love them. And still love them, even though they 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 dismiss us. 
oh, you're you're acting crazy like a fool. You're you're too much. You're a Bible thumper. I've right? been called that by, by my family. <laughs> you know, like, uh, what are you doing? You, you're Bible thumping again. It's like, I'm sorry. You know, I can't help it. Um, but you have to just be humble and uh, let people have their families and thoughts and be present for them because when they're reacting to you, they're not reacting to you. Are they? Who are they reacting to? They're reacting to God. They get mad and they get, who do you think you are preaching that? Or what do you think you're doing when you do that? Because it shines a light on them. And they think and they get uncomfortable. And they're wrestling with their God, not even you. They may be yelling at you or opposing you or disagreeing with you. And uh, it's 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 a real discipline to remain to remain humble and smiling and loving in the midst of that criticism. And then they will come to you maybe a year or two later and say, I remember when I criticized you and I really gave you the whole treatment and I'm so sorry. And I watched you for a year or two or three or five years and you have been steady. Um, peaceful ministry, no matter what. And they might come back and say, Oh, I don't know, I'm sorry, I misjudged you. That's the only thing you can do, right? Because if you try to convince them or argue with them or rust them to the ground about scripture, that's not going to help. That doesn't help. It makes things worse. Then they can walk away if they see how wild and crazy that person is. Yeah. What are the questions we have about the Holy Spirit? What's God working? Yeah. I, I have trouble with the male image of God. To me, you know, there's so many scriptures. God is described as a lesbian. Yep. And uh, I, I, I really think of God as a spirit. It's, it's, it's this mm -hmm. love. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's not necessarily. Well, in the Jewish scriptures, in the Jewish Hebrew scriptures, you describe God in in many multi different ways. God is like a mother hen, protect. God is like an eagle, strong. God is like a bear. God is like El Shaddai, the mountain top God. God is the God of uh, uh, Jehovah Jireh. God is the God of providing. God is described in many different ways. And our scriptures are written down by men. They were inspired by God, but they were written down by men in certain eras, certain time, in certain place. And you know what? If it wasn't for the women behind that movement, the rich women who did purple cloths and were busy working hard behind the scenes at the riverbed, Lydia and her purple cloth with the purple sweater. If it wasn't for those rich women who supported the apostles, there might not be any written scripture. They helped fund the writing and the telling of the story. But until that time, all the traditions, all this history was oral tradition, was spoken of around the campfires and the tents. And the women were a big part of helping it be formed into writing it. So men and women had both roles in that. I understand. Um, you have lots of political debate. We could get into a little some heavy politics, and then you really hate me. <laughs> but, but we're not going to go there because we don't need to. We know that God is all things, all things powerful for all of us. And if you are only a young girl in the jungle and you only know women and you think that you have an experience of God, what is your mind going to think about God? You're going to think it's God is a woman. Just as the people in Africa think God, Jesus is black, because that's who it is. And from that point of origin in the country, in the world, that makes sense. In Asia, they think God maybe looks like a little Asian person. And uh, we think, I think, you know, as a child growing up, that Jesus was long, long, here for life. Yeah. But that doesn't make sense, you know? But that's what we know. That's how the same people wrote the scripture. They describe God that way, and they use the word he. Yes. I just want to say I like um the passage in John 16 that 
Jesus tried to inform the his disciples that the, they will send the helper, the Holy Spirit, being called the helper. And in Genesis chapter one, um, God creating and calling woman the helper. Would that make him feel great and part of God's creation? That we are the helper, the Holy Spirit is the helper. And look at the ministry of women, they comfort. They strengthen so many, and that's what the Holy Spirit do. He enables. Yes. And God has been present for all the people for all time, in all different ways. Um, the Holy Spirit comes in the form of the comforter, yeah. the helper. Mm -hmm. And they come alongside one another, and it's male and female mm -hmm. together for the mystery. And that is true. And that's what John 16 talks when he said, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be gone forever now and i'm going to what give you the holy spirit i'm going to send a helper a comforter to come and be present and that's what you all are describing moments when god has been a comfort to you you know those moments when god is just with me and no one else knows that i know that god lives in my life i think this is true when we are at serving the people who are serving minister to us oh, far more than we do what we are doing to them. Isn't that beautiful? That is so beautiful. Every time I go and help out that Thursday night supper, my husband and I come home and we sit in <coughs> our humble, we have our own meal in our luxurious house, in all our comforts, and we think about the people that served us and we served them that night. And they ministered to us. We feel with tears in our eyes that we have been ministered to. When you give a cup of cold water to someone and they say, thank you, you are a blessing. Don't, don't, you feel, don't you feel fantastic? Not because I'm evil and I'm better. It's because they saw me and looked at me and looked at me with humble eyes and said, thank you. It meant something when they said that. You're so right. I get it. We get comforted back tenfold. Yeah, you have no idea. So when someone is confronting you or yelling at you or telling you you're wrong about God or Jesus or something, I have an impulse to smile. <laughs> you know, I have this impulse of like, my God, yes, it's okay to hate me. It's okay to hate me because someday you're going to love me and someday God got you by it. Uh, that's scruffy your neck, and God is going to work with you. And God's working with you now when you're yelling at me. It's okay. And so I've had somebody say, Well, what are you smiling for? In the midst of that. So those are the those are the moments where the Holy Spirit empowers us. What else do you want to explore about? Yeah. I sometimes struggle with being humble. Struggle with being humble. Mm -hmm. uh, more than being humble, which is why I can speak to more than that, be humble. And what is it about humility that's so hard? It comes very seldom, and it's the one thing that you do. And that's how it is. Society gives us that. Mm -hmm. And who am I compared to anyone else? That because at any moment it can be taken away, right? Any moment it can be gone and wiped out. And we've seen friends and fellow members who have been brought down. Yes. Yeah. I love TV shows and I love to go to movies. And I am just astonished at the way they use vulgarity and and words that, that are just right. and but still I laugh at it mm -hmm. and I keep going to see it. Right. Here. Right. It's our flesh, isn't it? It's, we're weak. That you is. know, when someone tells a dirty joke and you don't want to laugh, but you do. <laughs> you know you shouldn't laugh, but you do. Um, or you hear gossip and you participate and you know you shouldn't. But you do. So 
those are the, those are the great dilemma of our society. But if we're in a society that does not do that, refrains from gossip or bad language or risque comments, um, it's much easier. So it's a challenge for us all the time. You know, I'm glad you admitted to it. That's in the good for the soul, you know. But uh, it's human. All of us struggle with that. But I have success for myself that when someone is constantly, bitterly, nastily gossiping, you know, I, I just <coughs> stop responding and then I finally say, you know, I don't know what you're referring to and it's gossip and I can't engage in the conversation. And then that stops it immediately and they stop gossiping to me. They may go, they don't stop the rock game, they just go get yeah, the bells. That's interesting and wants to engage with them. But I had a yoga teacher one time. He said, every time you start to say something about someone, you think, is it true? Uh, is it necessary? Mm -hmm. Is it kind? You know, your old grandmothers would say, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That was what my grandmother taught me. And uh, it asks that checklist. You know, that's important. You know. And so what you're saying is that all of you are saying moments where it's hard to be a prophet. prophet. It's hard to see God's vision. It's hard to say in a situation to say, you know, be humble. And honest and open and loving in the face of all these circumstances. And God calling me every day, every day. It never gets easier. I never drive late and complete the program. Never. Right? And uh, so we're always going to do that. You know, any other questions and comments about the Holy Spirit? I think it's just a wonderful holiday. Yes. Yes, I just want you to say besides that, nobody can do like. You talking that something continuing with you except the help of the Holy Spirit. That's right. The Holy Spirit has to come in oh. and be with them. And so when they're gossiping violently, I'm looking at them and I'm start praying inside, like right? help this person because they are yes, they're mean spirited. They don't see the true picture. And it's not my job to change them, it's the Holy Spirit's job to change them. You're right. Absolutely. I can't do it. Because I'm not arguing with everybody. Yeah, I have to just let the Holy Spirit do it. So, and he's using you in many ways to do that. Uh -huh. yeah, well, because now, like when the drove come down, yeah. it didn't just start working. So, and we have to be that avenue, that mm -hmm. vessel we that we allow the Holy Spirit to use us. Yeah. And every day, help me, Lord, it would be a vessel for you. Use me. Use me. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, fantastic. Let's close in prayer. Is that what you do? There we go. Yeah. Okay, if I don't stand up, yeah, please. Um, before I do anything else, don't forget the collection. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is. And I already said this is appropriate for the weather, not necessarily a conversation. I guess it's hey. May the blessing of the rain be upon you, the soft, sweet rain. May it fall upon your spirit so that all the little flowers may spring up and get their sweetness on the air. May the blessing of the great rains be on you. May they be upon your spirit and wash it fair and clean, and leave their name the shining pool where the blue of heaven shines, and sometimes a star. Go. Oh, it's fair. Okay,